The purpose of this series is not to prove the truth of, but rather to outline an original systematic approach to a long contemplated and long discussed concept, namely love. I understand that my analysis cannot be exhaustive, as it must of necessity be brief. Yet I hope that it will offer an alternative to certain prevalent views of love, which often result in tragic consequences for those enacting them. Here, I take the view of a neo-enlightenment rationalist, atheist, materialist, and meliorist. The view I espouse is not necessarily philosophical rationalism, but it is common sense or practical rationalism, in that while I do not believe that every aspect of the world can be deduced from first principles, I do believe that every aspect of the world can be comprehended by human reason, and ought to be so comprehended. If love is a real aspect of the world, then it too can and ought to be comprehended by human reason. I will henceforth refer to the view I will outline and defend here as the practical rationalist view of love, and I will contrast it where appropriate with both the mystical view of love, the view that characterizes much traditional Western thinking on the subject, as well as a prevalent contemporary view, which for the sake of conciseness I will refer to as the entertainment view of love. My first major contention is that love is an intellectual emotional synthesis. Contrary to the prevalent view of love as just a feeling that is largely beyond an individual's control, the practical rationalist view holds that multiple human faculties are simultaneously involved in the phenomenon of love. Love certainly does contain an extensive emotional dimension, but just as extensive is the intellectual dimension of love. Both the mystical and the entertainment views of love acknowledge this emotional component, but they largely neglect the intellectual aspect, which is antecedent to the emotional. The human mind does not fathom the world through feelings, which are internalized and thoroughly automated normative evaluations. Before one can normatively evaluate anything, one must be aware of the thing which is to be evaluated. The raw data must come before the response to it. The raw data of the world comes to man through his senses. This data can come in the form of peaceful perceptions, such as observing a scene or hearing a sound, or through violent disruptions, such as pain or uncomfortably loud noise. After receiving the data, man evaluates it using his intellect and forms an opinion of what he ought to do regarding it. In order to liberate his conscious intellect, for still further evaluations of new data, many of his former evaluations, especially if they are repeatedly performed, become automated in the form of emotions. Thus, an individual might come to relish the sight of a peaceful meadow, while detesting the ruffian who drives through that meadow playing gangster rap music at deafening volumes. Without first becoming aware of meadows, or deafening gangster rap, it is impossible to have any feelings about them. Furthermore, that an emotion is formed is no guarantee that its underlying intellectual normative synthesis is correct. Rather, it is simply a sign that such a synthesis has been performed frequently and is persuasive to the individual. In the course of his life, an individual's prior normative syntheses shape the manner in which he subsequently perceives the world. Prior experiences and his emotional responses to them channel his future courses of action and condition his interpretative framework. The intellect and the emotions interact by mutual feedback. While new emotional syntheses must necessarily first arise through the intellect, the intellect often uses past emotional syntheses as inputs in making decisions about the external world. This renders virtually impossible an analysis of man apart from his emotions, but it also implies the impossibility of any aspect of man existing segmented from his intellect. The same interrelationships that render a man inextricably a creature of numerous emotions also render every aspect of him comprehensible via intellectual analysis and enable him to deploy such analysis to understand himself and the external world. Love is a specific kind of intellectual emotional synthesis. Namely, it is an intense emotional reaction to intellectually recognized goodness. The intellect recognizes that which is good, the object 
of love. And the emotions, if they have been previously conditioned to respond appropriately to the good, deliver a felt confirmation of that goodness. It is no exaggeration when an avid mathematician claims to love working with numbers, or a connoisseur of classical music confesses a love to the symphonies of Mozart. What they feel corresponds to and arises from their evaluations of the objects of their love as good, good because of their own qualities. After all, if the symphonies of Mozart were not comprised of certain sound waves and were instead comprised of others, say, sound waves replicating the screech of metal against glass, the music connoisseur would not love them. Love is experienced by him who loves, but it occurs because of that which is loved. The following illustration summarizes the causal and temporal chain that occurs with respect to love. First, we have the qualities of the perceived object. These lead to intellectual appraisal of the perceived object as good, and that leads to an emotional response of love to the object whose qualities are perceived as good. In the most important kinds of love, the object of love is another human being. To call a human being the object of love is not meant to objectify that human being. Rather, it is simply meant to express a distinction from the subject of love, the person who experiences and displays love toward the object. In most cases, the subject of love does not stop with a mere positive emotional appraisal of the object of love. Rather, that appraisal is followed by action taken to promote or advance the object of love. When the object of one's love is inanimate, such as an item or an activity, love of the object implies a desire to take possession, or secure the perpetuation of the item, or to engage in the activity. When the object of one's love is a person, love of the object implies a desire to take action to improve the well-being of that person in a material, emotional, and intellectual sense. Thus, a complete causal chain with regard to love also includes the implications of love with regard to actions. So we have the following chain. The qualities of the perceived object lead to intellectual appraisal of the perceived object as good, which leads to an emotional response of love to the object whose qualities are perceived as good, which leads to action in the furtherance of the object whose qualities are perceived as good. And this is the basic nature of love.